Okay. All right, welcome everyone. So tonight is the kickoff for um, something that Lissa has decided to um, start this semester with an alumni speaker series. So we are gonna host three UNCG alumni um, from different um, fields, you know, in librarianship and um, have them share what they've been up to since um, graduating. So tonight we have Derek Long. As you can see, he is head of the Mar Sound Archives at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And so um, um, before I welcome him, I wanted to tell you to mark your calendars for November 2nd and November 16th for the rest of the series. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Karen. Can everybody see my slides okay? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I have two screens and my slides are on the screen over here. So sometimes I'm going to be looking over here, but <laughs> just in case you're wondering. Um, so I'm going to start off just, um, just telling you a little bit about the Mars Sound Archives and then I'll kind of go over my path of how I got into the field within librarianship that I'm in. So the Mars Sound Archives, which is located at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, and I'll say I grew up in North Carolina and I don't think I ever knew that Kansas City was actually in Missouri. Uh, there is a Kansas City, Kansas, but when people refer to Kansas City, they're usually referring to Kansas City, Missouri. That's where the, the big city is. So, Anyway, the Mars Sound Archives is a collection of over 400,000 uh, AD items, and that's on 54 different formats, and that's different types of video, film, and all sorts of audio. We have mostly audio. Uh, we do have only about 10,000 of those items are uh, of moving image material. So some of the things we do, we do tours of the space, not now because of COVID, but uh, we used to do tours and we actually do quite a few tours. We would bring classes in. We'd also bring, um, we'd let uh, the public come in and we'd give tours to the public. Uh, we have a lot of playback equipment, like old equipment, like Edison cylinder players, uh, turntables, old Victrolas, things like that. And we actually demonstrate those to um, the folks that come in for tours and we talk about the history of, rec of recorded sound, the different eras of recorded sound, and we'll actually play some of the playback equipment so people can actually see how that works. We do some instruction. We work with some faculty members, um, develop assignments using parts of the collection. Uh, a lot of the things listed here like instruction, archival research, community outreach, these are a lot of things that most archives do. Uh, it's just where these are things are specific to our specialty of the type of format we have. So um, the instruction can be a little different because, you know, a lot of times when people want to do, faculty members want their students to uh, experience an archive, they actually physically want to come in the archive. So we have to, you know, teach people how to use a turntable and things like that so they can listen to some of our items. Um, archival research, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we see ourselves like any other archive as far as content goes. So instead of, you know, papers and photos and maps and things like that, that might be in our traditional archive, we focus on AV materials, but, you know, we see the content on those AV materials just as important as anything that's on paper because, you know, these are primary resources uh, that have very important cultural and historical content on them. So we get contacted by people all over the world uh, who find our catalog or our finding aids online and they contact us uh, wanting to use the collection. So it's used in scholarly articles, it's used in documentaries. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Ken Burns, um, but he's used our collections for his country music documentary, his jazz documentary. He's got one coming out on Hemingway or used a film from our collection. And it's also used um, by like journalists, um, 
internationally, locally, uh, like the BBC, CBS, um, a lot of organizations have used our collections. Sorry, I thought I saw a chat, but then it just popped up. Okay, uh, and then community outreach. Um, so we do a lot of things in the community where we work with other institutions. A lot of that will be like exhibits. Um, we recently worked with the American Jazz Museum, which is in Kansas City, on a Charlie Parker exhibit, who is one of the godfathers of bebop jazz, and he was born in Kansas City. So we worked with them on curating an exhibit and providing audio and some materials from our collections for that exhibit. Uh, we work uh, with some other, other institutions, but also an important part of community outreach is talking to people in the community, uh, working with people who are historically uh, relevant in the community, have contributed uh, to various communities. Um, a big push now is um, trying to assist underrepresented communities and their archiving efforts and that might not necessarily mean that we are trying to take on their collections but we want to um, help out and give them uh, resources and try to help them either if they want to donate you know we do offer that or if we can point them in a direction uh, like the the black archives of mid-america is in kansas city so if it's more relevant for that institution, we'll try to you know, potentially point them in that direction. So um, that's some of the general things that we do in the archives. I'm gonna get into a little more of that, but first thing I wanted to do was go over my educational and professional path a little bit. So you understand like how I got to the position that I'm in. So back in the early 2000s, I, I like started collecting records. I was DJing, I bought a beat machine. I was like using records to make uh, sample based music and things like that. And I was like, oh, I'd like to, you know, do something like this for a career. I was getting into audio engineering. So I went to Full Sail University, which is a for profit school in Florida. And they have programs like uh, filmmaking, graphic design, uh, game design, stuff like that. But I got a degree in. It's a it's associate's degree in audio engineering. Uh, you can probably see from my next slide or from my next picture after that, it didn't uh, go so well after I graduated because the industry just like fell out um, because the technology for recording audio became uh, very cheap and a lot of people were just doing it at home. So uh, there wasn't much money in audio engineering. So I decided to go Back to school, um, I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is very near Greensboro. And I wanted to stay in the area at that time. So uh, I applied and I went to school to get my history degree because I was, I always like to read um, and do research. So I decided I wanted to get a degree in history. And while I was there, I waited too long to get my, uh, to do my, credits for foreign language. So then I ended up just while I was there getting another degree, bachelor's degree in anthropology because I started taking anthropology classes and really enjoyed those. So I got a bachelor's from UNCG in history and anthropology. And I thought I was like, well, maybe I'll, you know, be a, or maybe, you know, I was thinking about like going and get a PhD to be a history professor. But after going to school for a while, I realized I'd, didn't really want to do that. It wasn't for me. So in 2010, I graduated from a bachelor's or with my bachelor's in 2011. In 2010, this uh, document came out from the Library of Congress. It's the State of Recorded Sound Preservation in the United States, a national legacy at risk in the digital age. And basically this document outlines that there are a lot of recordings in the United States that are in institutions that don't really have the resources, the staff resources or monetary resources, the equipment to preserve the items. Um, and as a 
history uh, and anthropology major, you know, I was very, you know, I, I could, it meant something to me that, you know, I was like, oh, this stuff is, you know, being lost because, and I'll get into that a little bit later on some of the details of this, um, because I have some examples I can show you, but a lot of the materials that are on AB formats are degrading rapidly and the content on it is degrading rapidly. So if we lose it, we're essentially losing part of our cultural heritage and history. And, you know, it's kind of, for me, fit with my background in audio and in history and anthropology. But I was like, well, what, what do I need to do to be able to like do this work? And, and I was like, well, basically I would need some sort of education in librarianship or archives. Uh, so I decided to go to the LIS program at UNCG. And when I went, I basically like already kind of knew like what I wanted to do. So I just focused like all of my uh, assignments around AV preservation so like anything where I could like kind of pick, you know, what uh, area I wanted to, you know, do a, an assignment on, that's what I would do. And then I also uh, got in contact with the Southern Folklife Collection at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, because uh, they have, um, they have facilities to preserve their AV content. And so I did my practicum there and I did an independent study there to get some experience. So that was like the first place I really got like hands-on experience with AV preservation. And with that, I mean, that really helped me a lot to kind of get my first job. Cause I don't, if I, if I hadn't done those two things, I'm not sure I would have been able to get my first job cause I really needed that experience. So when I graduated in 2013, uh, I got a job at the State Archives of Florida and I worked with this team called the Florida Memory Team and basically it's like an online platform, but I was an audio archivist. So I just digitized audio recordings from the Florida Folklife collection and I would create metadata for it and make the items available online. Uh, stayed there for a couple of years. Then I was actually at a library conference and met my wife and she lived in Kansas City. And so we, you know, dated for a while um, remotely, or not remote, but distance dating, and then I decided I was just going to move to Kansas City, and I didn't have a job or anything at the time, um, so when I got here, I ended up getting a part-time job at uh, MCC Community College, and it was definitely, you know, it's not what I wanted to do, but I learned a lot because I was doing reference and instruction for uh, the community college, so that kind of filled out some of the areas that I wasn't as comfortable with. I, you know, overall, I think it helped a lot. But at the same time, I was also volunteering in the Mar Sound Archives. So when I got here, like I immediately already knew some of the people that worked here. So I immediately uh, got in contact with them um, just because I know I needed to stay in the field and kind of be up to date and, you know, make sure my name was still you know, known in these circles, so it would be easier for me to get a job when one came open, um, which it did, and I was lucky enough to uh, get this position. Originally, it was the Mars Sound Archives librarian, um, and then I was made head of the Mars Sound Archives uh, about a year and a half into having the position. So, yeah, again, I feel very fortunate to have the, the position I do have, especially in a field that is there are other institutions that have similar archives as this, but um, there aren't a whole lot of jobs in the area. So um, I do feel lucky to have one. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the sound archives. This is a photo of our LP collection. And it's about 200,000 LP. So it's almost half of our collection. Uh, so, these are mostly commercially published materials um, of all types of musical genres, you know, rock, blues, R&B, jazz, opera. Um, that's uh, kind of runs the gamut of 
of commercial recordings. Um, and then you see on the end there, there's some of our uh, playback equipment. There's like an Edison cylinder player there, a couple of the uh, 78 machines, and some of those will demonstrate to people when they take a tour. <laughs> and this picture is of our automated storage and retrieval system. So this is actually attached to the library. So we have direct access to it. It's not off, uh, a lot of people, their storage like this is off campus or somewhere else, but this is actually attached to our building. So this was built, I think 11 or 12 years ago. And this was kind of in the era when libraries were, you know, like, oh, we, you know, we gotta get these books out of here. We gotta make space for students to study and um, have more open space. Uh, and so what our university did um, to facilitate that was they moved 800,000 books into the, they built this machine and moved 800,000 books into it. But we also use it for archival storage too. So there's three rows uh, or two or three aisles. And there's like two aisles that kind of look like this and they have mostly books in them. But then there's also an aisle that has uh, like these larger shelving units where you can put boxes on them. So we use that aisle a lot because we use archival boxes to put our materials in and then we put them in that aisle. And it's temperature and um, humidity controlled. So it's good for an archival environment. And it allows us to collect a lot of stuff because it's gigantic. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of some of the formats in the collection. So, I mean, this ranges from like early 1900s to uh, early 2000s. Uh, so we have, you know, some of the early like Edison cylinders. We have early 78 RPM discs. We have the vinyl disc. We have open reel tape, um, various types of tape, uh, CDs. Uh, the one I wanted you to kind of look at, because there's going to be a comparison on the next slide, is if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of that disc, it's a 16-inch disc, and it's a lacquer disc. So basically a lacquer disc, it's like a, it has a metal base, and then they wrap lacquer around it. And a lot of times for the 16-inch disc like this, radio stations would use them to record broadcasts. So what they would get, they would just get like blanks. So this one you see it has grooves on it, but when they, the radio station would get it, it would just be like a blank disc and they would have uh, a disc cutter. And so when they were recording the broadcast, they would put the disc cutter on and record the broadcast through the disc cutter and cut the grooves directly into the disc. And these are the most at risk AV, or I would say the most at-risk sound recording format that we have. And we have about 12,000 of these, but this is what happens to them. Um, this is uh, called delamination. And what happens is the lacquer basically develops a palmitic acid, and which is apparently harmless to humans, I'm told. Uh, but it makes the lacquer shrink, and when the lacquer shrinks, it breaks apart. So, you know, this disc, you know, there's no saving the disc. It's like when this happens, like the content, whatever was on the disc, any of the content, whatever it was, we don't know, is gone. Um, so we're trying to prevent that from happening by uh, preserving all of these as quickly as possible. So that's one of our top priorities. And so how we preserve things in the AV world is digitizing them. So that's the archival standard. I mean, you want to preserve, conserve the, the actual format as long as you possibly can. But long term, really the only thing you can do if you want to have that content in the future is to digitize, digitize it and then preserve the digital format. So this is kind of where my background in audio comes into play because um, I wouldn't know how to like use the audio equipment and the software and just know how all these things work. So I oversee our preservation studios. We have uh, two different preservation studios here at, on campus. 
and we can do almost all of our different formats. Um, most of the audio we can do, there's more of the video. There's a lot of weird video formats that we're unable to do. Um, and with those at some point, we'll need to figure out whether we're gonna do them in house and try to get the equipment or outsource them. But one of the issues with equipment is a lot of it, you know, was made so long ago and it's not made anymore. There's limited supply. So you have to like buy all this used equipment and kind of cobble together you know, this equipment to play the stuff back. And then if it breaks, it's like, you know, sometimes it's hard to find somebody to fix it. So the format degradation is as much of a problem as the playback equipment. So this is how much audio is digitized. I don't say audio, this is actually how much AV content is digitized in the Mars Sound Archives. And it's a little more drastic. It appears more drastic than it is. Uh, and I kind of do that for effect. But, and I don't know why my number's not showing up. This number up here at the top that's supposed to be digitized is 19,000 items or 5%. I don't know why it's not there. Anyway, um, so as I mentioned, out of our 400,000 items we have in the archives, 200,000 or LP recordings. And so a lot of those are like commercial recordings. And, you know, we're not that concerned about it. One vinyl is actually the most stable format, um, lasting up to what scientists say from um, researching, you know, scientifically doing tests on the format that a vinyl, as long as it's taken care of, can last up to a thousand years. So we're not too concerned about vinyl in general, but also because like a lot of that stuff was very popular. So, you know, we have stuff like Beatles or, you know, Aretha Franklin, you know, all this stuff that we don't really have to worry about because there's plenty of copies out there and we don't have to worry about digitizing it. So a lot of the stuff we have, we're not really worried about it. We're never going to digitize it. But there's probably around like 100,000 items that are unique. When I say unique, I mean, like one of a kind, like they, they weren't published. It's things like interviews that people created, field recordings, broadcast, uh, speeches, live performances. And those are the things that we concentrate on most because they are unique. And if we don't digitize them, then they could potentially be lost forever. So access to our AV materials. Um, we do some physical access. It's a little different now because of COVID. So we're by appointment only. So we, you can only come in if you have an appointment. We don't let people just walk in now because we have such a small space. But we do let people listen to certain items. Um, you will probably already know that since some of our items are degrading, degrading and we digitize them, we don't uh, let people listen to those items, the physical items but uh, all the LPs we let people listen to. So that's a lot of what people come in and listen to. Um, otherwise, for a lot of our content, uh, we digitize it. So if it's already digitized, that's easily made available. But if somebody requests something that hasn't been digitized yet, you know, we have the capabilities to digitize a lot of our stuff. And, you know, that's obviously ideal because we can make things available to people uh, all over the world. And, Sometimes it depends on the situation. I mean, there's like copyright issues and things like that. So it's like sometimes we'll provide a copy that they can download. Sometimes, you know, we, because we do have the capability to put up a recording that they can stream but not download. Of course, you know, I think if someone knows what they're doing, though, they could get it, really get it if they wanted a copy of it, they could make one. But um, we do try to make our uh, materials available digitally when we can, but we can't always do that depending on the situation. So discovery for AV materials, it's where things can get kind of messy when you're trying to provide reference for stuff like this because it's in several different places. So we have finding aids um, and that's basically uh, what the standard is to, for 
archival materials. So instead of like cataloging it like you would a book, uh, finding aids for like an entire collection of stuff. So if somebody donated, you know, all of their like papers and pictures and stuff, it'd be like, you know, the so-and-so papers uh, collection and like everything within that collection would be listed in the finding aid. Uh, in the past, my organization was just using like Word, Excel spreadsheets, um, which obviously is not a database, but you know, it work, it, it's fine for like the front end user, but like just to search like one collection. But when you don't have a database, you know, you don't have any links between any of the collections. So we're actually in the middle of implementing archive space, which is basically kind of the main archival management system used in the field and it's open source. Um, so that's been an interesting process, um, working with lots of spreadsheets. I, when I was going to school, I never realized how much I was going to be working in Excel spreadsheets because it has been out of control. Uh, there's also the library catalog. I am not a cataloger. I don't do any cataloging, but we send some of our commercial collections to the catalogers and then they catalog it, put it in our library catalog but then it lives in our space. So this stuff is available uh, for our local catalog, but it's also, you know, an OCLC, so you can, uh, it's available on like WorldCat, which is, you know, how a lot of people find us as they find us in, you know, WorldCat, before, you know, and contact us. And then there's also our asset management system. Uh, we have Island Dora, and basically it has a Fedora repository back end and then a Drupal front end and Island Door kind of makes the two work together. And it's just like a bunch of modules and stuff for our online platform. Um, and I can show you what that looks like, but basically um, what the asset management system is for is for preserving the, the digital objects and then provides metadata about those digital objects. So here's a record of a, uh, 1937 radio broadcast recording from our collection. Um, so you can see the we have the audio file that you can play in the, the media player. Um, that's just a picture of the the disc up there. The not the whole disc, but the the label of the disc is what's pictured there. Um, on the right, you can see all the metadata for the program. So you use, I don't know if any of you. Um, are into metadata or want to do metadata work, but this is the mods schema uh, that we use for our for our metadata. And then on the left, under the player, it's a transcript, and we're using this module called the Oral History Solution Pack, and basically it lets you uh, upload a transcript where it can like break the transcript down like line by line and have an audio cue for each one. So if you were like going through this and like reading it. Uh, then you could just like hit that cue on the left and it would play from uh, that point in the audio. Now this is a very slow process transcribing, that is like, but I guess a silver lining with the code when we all went remote from COVID is that we had a lot of people that needed work to do because their work was tied to the physical space. And now that they weren't in the physical space, they didn't have as much work to do. So I started a project um, where people could download audio files and create transcripts. And then we had like a shared space to keep track of everything. So ended up so far, I mean, we're back at w work now. Um, we're kind of doing part remote and part on campus. But uh, we've gotten about 400 transcripts done uh, since COVID started. Um, so it's probably, well, and it's interesting. There's like, cause I've been going to some presentations and panel discussions about, you know, what people are doing during the time of COVID. And there's, I am definitely not the only one who thought about doing this cause there's a lot of other places who are doing the same thing with their audio and uh, moving image collections is having people 
um, transcribe it while they're working remotely. Uh, this is uh, one of the last things I'll show, uh, and I have it on here because it, it happened recently. Um, I wrote a grant uh, for the Clear Recordings at Risk grant, and we were lucky enough to be awarded for the grant, and it was to preserve <laughs> some 1940s radio broadcasts on severely damaged lacquer disc. So I already told you about lacquer disc, but one of the things I didn't mention was during the 1940s, uh, when during World War II, the US military was using all the metal for the war. And so those discs, they were, you know, had the aluminum metal base that the lacquer was wrapped around. But since they couldn't use metal, they decided to use glass. So you have a, you know, a 16 inch wide piece of thin glass. So as you can probably imagine, they break really easily. So that's mostly what the discs were that uh, I wrote the grant for was the, were these glass discs. And we couldn't digitize them by any traditional means on a turntable. So we had uh, NEDCC, which is Northeast Document uh, Conservation Center, they have this machine and it's called Irene. And it's basically this technology where it takes super, super high resolution scans of inside the groove of the disc. And it like takes these high resolution scans of the entire, all like everything within all the grooves in the entire disc. And then they have a software that basically puts all the images together to create the audio sound from the images, which I explained it. I had no idea how it works, <laughs> but that is the general idea. But uh, I don't know. It's cool, super complicated. Um, the guy who created it, he worked on uh, is it the Hadron Collider uh, in Europe and basically used the same technology for capturing um, images of like the particles and the particle accelerator. Um, but yeah, so anyway, there's only like three of these in the world. There's one at NEDCC, and so we wrote a grant uh, for them to be able to, to scan and digitize these discs. It is super expensive and it's very slow. Um, I think, and see, so to give you an idea of how expensive this is, is so $33,000, that was just to ship 30 discs to have digitized. So that's it, it was just like, all the money's going to any DCC except for the shipping. So, you know, it's like over $30,000 for them to digitize 30 discs. Um, and it takes, it's gonna take them like 230 hours or something like that. So while it's cool, it's ultra expensive and extremely slow. So it should really only be used on um, materials that can't be digitized any other way. I got a couple of resources here. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the field of AV preservation and archiving, uh, there's Associated for Recorded Sound Collections, which I've been heavily involved with. Um, there's also Equivalent Association, but it's international. I haven't been as involved with them, but they do have some great, um, if you go to their website, they have some great materials to, for learning about like audio digitization and stuff like that. Um, if you're more interested in like film or video, there's Association of Moving Image Archivists. So that's like specifically um, for moving image materials. And then there's the Society of American Archivists. Um, and in general, Society of American Archivists has a lot of great resources, but they do also have a recorded sound round table, which is specifically uh, for recorded sound. Um, so yeah, those are a few things. And if there's any, if you're interested, I can point you in directions of like specific uh, publications or anything like that. If you're interested, you can just let me know. Uh, you can feel free to email me if you'd like. 
And that is pretty much all I had to present, but I'm definitely up for taking any questions that you all might have. Uh, hey. Hey. Uh, thanks for doing this talk, first of all. I really have no knowledge in this field whatsoever, so it was really interesting just to kind of get a glance at it, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm a first-year student, so I'm still trying to evaluate what kinds of classes I should take with a look at archival work. So do you remember any classes that really had an impact on the kind of work you're doing now or any skills you learned while doing independent study? Sure. I mean, I'll, to be honest, uh, I think Fati's classes were probably the most useful for me. Because uh, at the time, I don't think he teaches a, da a database class anymore, but I'm guessing he still does a metadata class or somebody's doing a metadata class. I would definitely take that. I mean, just like, because all these systems are, if you're trying to do anything that's like, kind of like the background, like you're doing like either metadata cataloging, archival processing. There's a lot of similarity and just like knowing how the systems work. And so if you can take like any like metadata classes or learn about digital libraries, I would definitely take those classes. There wasn't an archival class when I was at UNCG. I don't know if there is now, but um, yeah, I think for me, um, learning about, because to me, like when I was gone, I was like, I mean, digital was kind of the, what I wanted to focus on, because I knew that was where a lot of the work that I was doing was going to be. So um, that's really where I focused. Gotcha. Thanks so much. You're welcome. I'm learning Excel. That's also good. <laughs> I really enjoyed this presentation as well. I have only learned, I, like I'm not focusing on archives, but I always love when there's a lecture connected to archives because it's just interesting stuff. Um, but when you were talking about the lacquered discs, you mentioned how they couldn't be repaired, but then mm -hmm. the glass ones can't, like the machine can repair them, but. Well, I'll go back to. I it's only like if they warp. No, they don't warp. So actually this one is glass that you can see um, here. But so when that stuff like flakes off, they can't really put that back together. So I guess what I'm when let me just try to bring up a picture. It'll be easier for me to explain. I have one that I can get to easily. Perfect. Right, let's see. Okay. Can you see that one? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, okay. So, like you said, it's like because the grooves are all still there, the the lacquer is not flaking off, but it's just broken. So when they do a scan of that, it's pretty easy for them to scan it because all the grooves are still intact. It's just if you try to play that on a turntable, it's you can't play it on a turntable. Um, so basically the grooves have to be there in order for Irene to be able to capture the groove. So they can do that, but with this one, they can't do that okay. because the grooves have like flaked off. And like, if you could take all those grooves and like, if you could put all the pieces back together, they could potentially do it, but it'd be kind of a nightmare. Yeah, that would be a lot, really challenging. It's definitely an interesting field of work that I got to work in and have to remind myself of that. Sometimes it's like, this is pretty cool. I liked how your kind of path like took you to librarianship. Like you didn't initially consider it, but then it just seemed to work out. Like that that's what you're supposed to work Yeah, in. you know, it's funny. I mean, because honestly, I didn't know anything about librarianship really when I was getting my undergrad and it was 
yeah, I mean, it was pretty much this, like I said, that that document that the Library of Congress published really like changed my trajectory. I was just like, hey, this is something I, you know, have passion for. And, you know, I want to, I felt like I had a good background for it. So, and then when I went to library school, I was like, I didn't know exactly what to expect, but I was, you know, I, I really liked it. Um, and I'm really glad I did it, even though I didn't know exactly what I was getting into at the time. <laughs>